Welcome to the Radical Lifestyle Podcast, brought to you by Generation to Generation, where you will be inspired by the past, equipped for the present, and prepared for the future, as we engage in conversations with people from around the world. Hello everyone, this is Andrew and Daphne from Generation to Generation, and our guest today is Dale Kaufman. Dale, for people that don't know who you are, can you just say a bit about where you're from and what you do? Well, I'm a former street fighter who was born in China and uh, was miraculously brought into the kingdom in spite of my craziness by Jesus. And um, I became what I vowed I would never be. My grandfather was a pioneer missionary in Tibet, my father in China, part of awakenings there. And I said, I would never, ever be a missionary or involved in full-time ministry, but (laughs) never say never. Uh, The Lord really um, brought me to himself. And um, so I have been now um, involved in full-time ministry for the last 48 years, I guess almost 50 years, Uh, and uh, have a beautiful wife, my best uh, friend in the world, and uh, lovely children and grandchildren. So it's that stage in life where you're able to not only look back, but to go, oh my goodness, I'm a part of the Caleb generation, right? I'm the, <laughs> the guys that are saying, give me this mountain. And so in our age, we're actively moving forward together with the generation. So it's a privilege to be with you. And I'm coming to you now from California at this time, but my heart is in the nation. So I'm restless and anxious to get on with what's happening in the nations, not just virtually, but physically as well, and have lots of exciting plans to come. So today is a special privilege because I get to be with you guys who I respect so much. It's a real joy. Well, it's, uh, yeah, the struggle is real. We have that same struggle as you do, of that itch of wanting to get going again and, and moving fast around the world. People who listen to this, they may say, I like this guy, Dale. Uh, I want to find out more about him, see more of the stuff that he's putting out there. Where could they do that? It's kind of a well-kept secret. I can't give it to you real easily. Uh, One of the ways to connect with us would be through our uh, Kingsley's International KKI website, uh, which is kki.global. And uh, you can go there and there are different, uh, you know, teachings and things there. But I'm actually not very organized in getting my teachings out there. I'm sort of walking spontaneously through the years. So it gets picked up here and there. So uh, what I'll share with you today is probably what I've never shared before. So we'll, <laughs> we'll just take our steps together. I know that website will uh, communicate a lot of what your heart is, whether it's you directly or someone else on the team communicating it. It's still a lot of it is coming through you into them and, and out the other side. So uh, we'll put that link in the description box. So for people listening, you can go straight there and it's ready for you to click on. Yeah, and I refer to that because I have the privilege and, you know, the scripture says that God chooses the weak and the unwise, right? Which is how I qualify. <laughs> and um, I was, for some reason, chosen to uh, birth a ministry that works with children and young people, you know, and parents and the generations um, now for these years. Uh, and the, the, the almost laughable strangeness of that was because of my painful childhood and youth. I had zero interest in working with those ages. And so a real privilege to be involved with our father and seeing these things happen. So that website is a ministry that I I serve as the founder of and uh, kind of a source of some of the materials that are there. Okay. Well, I I often laugh that our background is one of being broken as a family. And now we do stuff with generations and families. and, And I thought, who's more unqualified than us but it turns out there may be three of us sitting here who are very unqualified (laughs) for what we do so (laughs) this is great (laughs) the bible calls us peculiar people i think right (laughs) i know that a lot of people listening will certainly put that on us or the word crazy but you know dale we um we're excited to have you because we know we run with just the same heartbeat, the same DNA. Uh, and we were so excited when we met you for the first time. We thought, Here is, here's somebody who, who gets where we're coming from. And so we're really excited to have you. And we have all been walking through a time of shaking. It, it, the world has been shaken. So can you start talking to us about this shaking, what it means, what are the dangers, what, what, what are the positive things? Because one of the talks that I heard you do was on the shaking. 
In fact, I'll let on a secret to those who are listening, who may have heard it. We tried to get you to do a talk on that and we knew exactly where we wanted it and we couldn't get you. So I went, I listened to your talk, (laughs) I made it my own and I delivered it. So now everybody knows that amazing talk I did on the shaking actually was stolen from you. So I'll give you credit now, okay? Well, I'll duck and I'll give credit to the source of that too, right? We'll do it together. (laughs) Well, this was a very strange experience for, well, maybe not strange, but challenging. 15 years ago now, I think almost, uh, maybe closer to 10. Time sort of changes as you get older. Um, And here I was one day saying, Father, what's in your heart? Could you show me something that is important to you? Just one of those days, right? Being in his presence, worshiping him, waiting there. And And he he led me to Hebrews 12, uh, verses 26 through 29. And uh, and there he basically, you know, explained that once again, he was going to shake not only the earth, but the heavens, which does mean, dear friends, that there will be asteroids and other things coming our way, very probably. (laughs) And Jesus spoke about it as well. But he goes on to say that he's going to shake everything that can be shaken, that has created things. So what can't be shaken remains. And so he was speaking about shakings that would be global, not just an earthquake here and there, but something throughout the whole earth, right? So I began to speak this out. And I said, you know, it's not just that he's going to shake people up out of judgment. This is an act of mercy where he's awakening people through the shakings to turn to the only two things that will never be shaken, right? And there's only two. Jesus the same yesterday, today, forever. Uh, God himself. And the second is his his promises, his word. Heaven and earth will pass away, by the way, (laughs) but my word will not, is what Jesus declared. And so even though, you know, Christians would say, yeah, I believe that. When the shaking comes, you find out, do you really uh, trust in these, right? (laughs) Are they really unshakable? Uh, Can you take hold of that more than the ground you're standing on? And so a time for believers to be drawn closer to him, closer to his word, and closer to each other, because in the very next verse, it goes on to say, listen, this is not just uh, about survival. (laughs) This is about being involved in the, the most privileged time in history, when I am going to bring my people into what he refers to as the unshakable kingdom. Because in the next few verses, it says, Uh, Since we're receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks and worship God with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And so we began to speak this out, right? There's a shaking coming when it comes. Don't be surprised. Don't be frightened. It's God in his mercy shaking uh, the nations so they'll be awakened to really ask questions about what can I depend on, you know? Who, what is there, and that this they will be drawn to me, my the believers and also non-believers, to me, my word, and into discovering what it does mean to live the unshakable kingdom. You know, what is that? How does that work? And so when the COVID, uh, you know, these different viruses hit, all the people I'd been in, in uh, touch with went, good, Dale, it's a shaking. And I said, absolutely, it is. But please be careful. It's not the one and only shaking. This is the first of a series of shakings that will be coming. And so let's not just hang on and hope it passes soon so we can get back to normal. It will never be normal. The world will never be the same again. So it's a time not only to draw near, but a time to prepare so that we are prepared in God to not only walk through the shakings that are already in motion, but into what God has purposed all along, which is the privilege of seeing the knowledge of his glory cover the earth as the waters cover the seas. The privilege of seeing his gospel uh, and of his kingdom proclaimed in the whole world for a witness before the end comes. And so here we are on the cusp of not just the most difficult things the world has ever seen, but also the most amazing things. that God has purpose for this time. And you and I have the privilege of being alive today. Whoa, you know, some people are feeling sorry for themselves that are in quarantine. I say, hey, just a minute. I'm in a very special uh, position in God being prepared to go into incredible things that generations before would have given anything to be a part of, but we are. 
privilege to be a part, aren't we? So I'd like to just speak for a few moments about some of the projections that I, I believe our Father is uh, encouraging me to recognize that are happening today and unfolding in our midst. But our real question is this, you know, how do we welcome the emerging generations, the children, the young people, those of all ages, including the older Caleb generation, how do we welcome them to join us, right? In walking with our Father through this time so that the dreams of his heart are fulfilled uh, in, in the way that we are able to trust him, uh, love him, trust him, and obey him a step at a time for things that Jesus spoke about so clearly, right? <laughs> These are not new surprising things. They're things he spoke very clearly about, and of course, in other ways, prophetically in the past, unfolding before our eyes. And just as the church was born in adversity, and just as the church found how to live the kingdom of God so vitally, that in their time, they didn't call, refer to them as those Christians. As you know, they referred to them as the people of the way, right? Mm -hmm. That's what they called them. Oh, what's that about? Oh, you should see the way they live. Oh, what's that? Oh, they've learned to live the way Jesus lived. It's the Jesus way of living that they've learned. And uh, it's actually unstoppable. It's transformational. It turned the Roman Empire upside down or right side up or however you want to say it. <clears throat> they said that, right? Those who've turned the world upside down have come here as well. How? Because they were saying all the right things. Yeah, that was part of it. They were doing uh, miraculous things. Yes, that was a part of it. But really, the core of it was they had learned to live the Jesus way in the midst of adversity. And that's what God's calling us into. So what I want to do today in the few minutes we have is to speak about these two things. One is to recognize the context <clears throat> of what is happening and what is unfolding rapidly, which I think all of us recognize, but it would be good to just recognize a few things there. And then to look in the midst of it at some of the dangers that lurk uh, there. But rather than you know, kind of trying to figure out how do we survive this and how do we come through it, to really see how do we actually come into walking with our father the Jesus way? You know? How do we develop a lifestyle that is the Jesus way in the midst of these things, which I believe will also include the greatest spiritual awakening the world has ever seen. And God is preparing us for that. And then in that power and his glory to be a part of, uh, I believe, a very strategic role in Maranatha, right? Preparing for Jesus' return. So first of all, just some of the obvious things that are happening uh, in our time. I think you know that even more dangerous than COVID is the level of fear. Is that right? Yeah. That definitely. has people's hearts. People are frightened. I mean, and, and when you see loved ones passing away and all the things, and you see the press, right? The media exploiting it. They're making a lot of money on scaring people. Is that right? <laughs> and they're behind that with all kinds of agendas to control things. And so it's a very, very intense, fearful time. It just breaks my heart when I walk down the road and I wear a mask uh, in certain places, you know, to respect what is expected there. Um, and I see the fear in their eyes. And I'll often say to them, oh, you know, it's nice to be able to recognize people's eyes these days because that's about all you can see. I mean, it's a great time for bank robbers to be around, right? Because they <laughs> wearing a mask. <laughs> but other than bank robbers, uh, most of the other people, their eyes look quite fearful. You have beautiful eyes, but they're filled with fear. Uh, and, and it's just kind of an open door, isn't it, to talk about uh, the anecdote to fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And so many people that I've had the privilege of leading to the Lord, total strangers, I mean, I was uh, at Starbucks down the road here just a little while ago, and I was sitting there, and this little old lady came up, and she was so crestfallen and looked very frightened and troubled. And she sat down there, and as I always do, because um, every morning I, I have a funeral service, I go to the cross, right? I deal with my biggest problem, which isn't the devil. It's me trying to help God. And so, you know, the invitation, take up your cross daily and follow him. I find that, you know, getting out of the way is wonderful and being a dead man walking. Is that right? Relying fully on Jesus 
uh, is life. That's why my life is getting better and better the older I get, because my memory is not as good. I have to depend on the Lord more and more of Jesus is much better. Is that right? <laughs> so I'm sitting there and I look at this lady and I say, Father, what are your thoughts towards this precious little lady? You know, I wasn't coming up with how should I encourage her or whatever. I'm just saying, Father, what are your thoughts? What do you want to do here? And he spoke just this thought to my mind that was a little bit strange. And he said to me, you know, her dog has died. Right? Not that, oh, well, that's, that would be kind of, you know, heartbreaking for this little lady. And so I said, excuse me, ma'am, you're looking very sad and maybe even a little frightened. And she said, yes, it's, it's a very, very difficult time for me. And her voice was shaking, you know. And I said, uh, is it possible that you've lost a good friend? Oh, yes, she said, a dear friend for 15 years. And he, he passed away. I said, this may sound a little bit strange, but is it possible it was your dog? She whipped around and stared at me and she said, how did you know that? I said, I don't, but there's somebody who does and he's here with us. Oh, she said, what are you talking about? Are you talking about God? I said, well, in a sense, but there's lots of things that are called God. I'm talking about the one who created you and loves you. He's here with us now and he knows your pain and your fear. Oh, she said, I don't go to church. I said, well, thankfully, God isn't limited to church. Uh, He's here with us now. And would you like to talk to him? Could we just speak to him together? She said, would that be okay? I said, be much more than okay. He'd be (laughs) thrilled. We could talk to him. This precious little lady opened her heart, sobbing, you know, speaking to God. God, I don't know you very well, but... No, 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 no. And I said, now, through Jesus, you know, and I explained, uh, and she gave her life to the Lord, right? I mean, just in the midst of the fear, the shakings, right? Wonderful things are happening. But the the context we live in is one where we recognize uh, a number of things that are in motion. And we could take a long, I think the rest of our time just talking about all these things, right? But I just want to touch on a few. And to really recognize that Um, beyond this shaking that we're in now, there's very probably going to be a major economic crash that's going to be happening. We'll hit the wall. And of course, the answer to that is what the Chinese government has very recently declared, which is that they're going digital, right? They're doing away with all currency. And then they explain why. And they say, because this is the only way we can ensure that we will have good citizens. Okay. And I had a pastor visiting here just recently and said, Dale, we can't live in China anymore. We're here because nobody can give us any money or resources. Because in order for them to have access to resources, what they're doing has to be authorized by the government, right? That it's legal. And then whoever that you pass money to in any way, because it's all digital now, you have to do it online. What they're doing has to be recognized and legal as well, right? She says, other than them giving us some chickens and some potatoes or something, you know, we have no way to receive resources at all, you know, because of what's happening. And I thought, well, that's not a surprise, right? That's what's coming on. I remember, I won't mention names here, but I remember before COVID started, a very well-known leader was saying that when the pandemic comes, it will be an opportunity for the world to unite in a way that will bring peace and stability and well-being for mankind. It will be expensive, lives will be lost, but it will be worth it in the end because of the good outcome that would be there. And they went on to say one of the necessities will be that we will have digitalized economy. It will also be important to ensure the protection of people's resources by having their identity you know, attached to their body so that this is the way that we can ensure nobody is stealing their resources. It's very stable. And it will also enable us to really flush out terrorists and those who are opposed to world peace, right? They're talking about this, right? Together with the head of the World Bank and all these other people before, you know, the pandemic even hit, right? I don't know if they helped at the start or what happened there, but (laughs) the thinking has been there all along, okay? And so we see that there's going to be an economic uh, element that comes in that will affect all of our lives. We see that the follow through of vaccines is that they will have to guarantee that you are actually the person who took that vaccine. 
and that you have taken vaccine number 14 or how many series of vaccines you know that are coming and to ensure and all of it is about safety right all of it is about the well-being of man and when you talk about humanity uh, finding a way to be stable and to provide for people's needs and for there to be peace, very good things, but to do it without God, right? Dangerous. Um, you know, yeah. that, that it's very logical what you need to do. It's not, the logic is not evil. And I think there are people with evil intent, but I think they're very sincere people okay, <laughs> who are saying, how do we look after people? You know, how do we deal with, terrorists? How do we, you know, deal with injustice? How do we deal with famine? How do we deal with these problems? You know, how do we deal with nuclear weapons? How do we deal with climate change? How do we, you know, all these things that are building up on one on top of the other, the fear level is such that they're really looking for answers. And one of the things they realize is what they realized in the very beginning when humanity got together at the Tower of Babel, right? Yeah. And they said, we've got, we've got to come together if we're going to survive. We have to do it together. We have to have one language, right? <laughs> we have to make a, make a name, have an identity together. Uh, this is our key for our future, right? And God, of course, had a very different plan. Uh, and we won't go into just why he did that. He basically summarized it so that man would reach out and find him, right? Yeah. In the way that he gave them languages and whatever. But mankind in their crisis, are going to be going back to that kind of a humanistic answer. Is that right? Exactly. To bring exactly. peace and safety. Okay. And that in itself is not a bad thing. Is that right? Those are good things, you know, to find peace and safety. But when you do it from a humanistic perspective, there's only really one way to have peace, right? And that's what is being um, described usually as equal rights. You know? mm -hmm. If every person is willing to support the right of every person to be happy in the way they choose, right? Then there's no tension. I'm okay, you're okay. We're all happy together, right? That's a humanistic world peace. Is that right? And when you have particularly our children and young people being bombarded um, with the whole issue of equal rights, right? Um, even to the point that children from a young age feel that they are, they have the right, right? They have a right to happiness. And if they don't get what they, you know, makes them happy, it's like, you're unjust, you're evil. You should make me happy, you know? And you have this whole generation of children coming up, is that right? Who have this mentality that says, oh, love is that you make everybody happy. And this is actually what God wants. God wants everybody to be happy. Well, there's some truth in it, right? But Romans 1.25 says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worship the creature rather than the creator. The truth of God is that our number one priority is not man. Is that right? Sure. It's to love God first with all of our heart, soul, mind, and, uh, and strength. And secondly, our neighbors ourselves. And when our priority concern becomes the well-being of man, right? It's, it's humanism, is that right? Humanism in essence is the exaltation of man and seeking the happiness of man. And of course, God loves everybody. He wants them to be blessed, right? Happiness is, is a, a fruit. Uh, actually, it isn't described as a fruit, joy is, but uh, there is, you know, fulfillment and joy in our walk with God. But we're living in a time where that uh, moment will come when the question will be, are you a person of peace? Um, or are you selfish, proud, set in your ways and unwilling to support the right of others to be happy? And it'll be the moment when it's recognized that actually the Bible is hate literature, you know? It's actually, it teaches to hate, right? Yeah. Things that some people love. It's divisive. It's destructive. And many of our children and young people are going to be in a very difficult place, right? Because all of that looks so good and seems so right, you know, for mankind. 
And if you do agree with that, then you are able, right, to be a part of the system. And uh, you benefit from that system in all kinds of ways, right? If you're not a part of that system and you're out of it, whew, uh, that's, a, that's a huge challenge. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're coming to that time quite rapidly. And my time is short here, so I can't go through the other shakings, I believe, that are coming. Uh, in our world that bring us to that point. As you know, the scripture says that there'll come a time when they will say peace and safety, right? And then there'll be sudden destruction. So the whole issue of world peace, right? Uh, And dealing with the fears that we have is, is something that is only going to be answered from man, you know, man's answer which is the anti or false Messiah answer, which is going to be carried through every digital you know, means possible. Um, I was reading in Revelation about the beast, right? That was controlling everybody. And I thought, what in the world is a beast? You know, the image of the beast. I thought, what does that look like? You know, is it shaped like a, a demon or an angel or what's the image, right? And I was on the subway there in Hong Kong and as I looked around, every single person was on their phone, right? Every one of them, just thousands of people on the phone. The image, yes, okay, I get it. <laughs> you know, the control factor that's so deep. So today I want us in the time we have left to really look at how do we welcome the emerging generations, right? To join us. Can I ask a, a question um, before we carry on? We're talking about the fear and there's the fear of, of COVID or the economic collapses or the riots maybe that we see going on. There's the fear yeah. driven by those things. Uh, lots when, of violence come. Violence is one of the further shakings that will come. Increased yeah. violence, yeah. Uh, one of the things that we've seen, and, and we did an episode on this, because um, we've said to people, we need to be having these kinds of conversations about the times that we're living in, um, what are indicators of things which are to come um and and so we've said people need to start engaging these conversations because a lot of people aren't talking about this but one of the things we've seen is that people um in talking about these things are causing other people to fear and the way they communicate about the times we're living the way they communicate about the years which are ahead of us they cause fear to rise up in other people. And we've had yes, to absolutely. deal with, with the fallout of those kinds of conversations. So could you just talk a little bit about how can we communicate with each other about these things which can cause fear to rise up without causing each other just to be more fearful within right. our conversations? Right. That's why, to me, I start with the unshakable kingdom language, you know, mm. that are being called into the unshakable kingdom, Right. And that's where I want to end up today in the next few minutes is to really look at how do we live in the unshakable kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Where I believe it's not just the worst of times. I mean, Jesus, it was interesting. In Matthew 24, 13, he he describes, you know, uh, before that all these different things should be hated by the nations and all the things that go on. And then he says, but those who endure to the end will be saved, right? And the word there is hupomone, which is the word for patient endurance, you know? those who go through this, the next very next verse, verse 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom, right, will be proclaimed in the whole world for witness, then the end will come. So it's a description of these challenging circumstances in the midst of which we learn patient endurance. But as we do, God meets us and we experience then this amazing overflow of his presence and witness that prepares the nations for Jesus to come back. And so we have both these elements, don't we? The challenge, but then we have more than the answer. We have the overwhelmingly wonderful provision of God for us in his kingdom and how we are preparing now, not just preparing for bad things to come, right? We're preparing to enter into the fullness of his unshakable kingdom and how we live that. And that's what I refer to as walking with the father, the Jesus way, which was what the New Testament church, right? Experienced and lived. And it worked for them, and it will work for us, too, as we go forward. Does that make sense? Can we go on in yeah. that? Yes, yeah, do, do. Yeah, there's a lovely passage of Scripture in First John uh, and uh, chapter 2. Um, <clears throat> and it's verse the last part of verse 5 and, and verse 6. It says, 
This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. Um, and it's a, a challenge to say, okay, um, if we say that we believe in Jesus and we abide in him, have we learned to walk our lives the way Jesus walked his life? I mean, we all want that, is that right? But I'd like us to look a little more closely at what that actually means to walk with the Father the Jesus way, and out of that to live the unshakable kingdom, uh, which can face adversity of all kinds and overcome those adversities and see his kingdom released into the nations, right? And it's not the first time, it's what the New Testament church did, so we're not inventing something new, but we are actually going to be experiencing, I believe, amongst other things, the greatest awakening the world's ever seen. Because as you know, the promise of Joel was only partially fulfilled on the day of Pentecost. Is that right? Hmm. There were no South Americans there. <laughs> and the promise was, I'll pour out my spirit upon all peoples, right? All peoples. Your sons and daughters, your young men, your old men, you know? Um, their inclusion in this great awakening. And uh, so often it's so interesting jumping ahead a little bit here. Uh, my grandfather was uh, in Tibet and God told him to move to the east coast of China to fast and pray with pastors to prepare for a visitation, which became the Shandong awakening, uh, in which about 30 million people came into the kingdom. Watchman Ni nee and others that you might know, you know, were a part of this. Mm -hmm. And then in my father's <clears throat> generation, he followed there into China. A similar thing happened. God told him, you need to prepare for the uh, great awakening that's coming to China. But it will come with adversity, right? With great persecution with Mao Zedong, who was responsible for liquidating 70 million people, okay? Were destroyed. I won't go into the gory details. You know, Stalin, 20 million, Hitler, 68 million, but Mao, 70 million people. Uh, you talk about horrific persecution that came on. But it was out of the context of that, is that right? That the house church awakening came. And there, we don't know exactly how many, 150, 180 million coming into the kingdom. You know, the things that have gone on. So the story of adversity and of God's intervention, you know, that breaks forth in the midst of the darkness, the light shines the most brightly. These are things I believe that God is, is very committed to and bring us into. So we need to understand these things so that we're preparing ourselves, right, for both of these, right? Preparing ourselves not to be frightened, not to be overwhelmed, because they're not a surprise. We understand what's going on, but we're not just kind of buckling down to endure this. We're going, we're pressing in to what it means to live the unshakable kingdom. We're wanting to learn how to walk with the Father the Jesus way uh, which is the way that actually brings about transformation of nations, right? Even in the midst of great adversity. So that's our real joy and hope, right? As we go forward. So I'd like us to look at this a little more closely. How much more time do you think we could work with here? Oh, what do you think? Got we've got enough. How much? We've got about uh, so? 20, 25 minutes. Okay, we'll try to do this. Plenty okay. of time. It's usually a 12 hour, it's a 12 hour series, but we'll do it in 20 minutes. We, could, we can run a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Are you with me? Are we going okay today, yes. guys? Yes, we're right with this you. It's relevant uh, in what we're looking at. And what I'd like us to do, and I don't know if there's a way, maybe as we put this on to put it in the chat or whatever, you know, some of these scripture verses that people mm -hmm. can look at later as they come along. But we come to this verse um, in John chapter 5, verse 19, as we're looking at this question, how did Jesus walk with the Father? And uh, you'll, you'll probably recognize this right away. It says, Jesus said, the son can do nothing by himself. Now, that's kind of an extreme statement, right? I'm sure he was very physically strong. In fact, when I went to Nazareth, I was surprised to find out that the carpenters didn't build houses out of wood. They were stonemasons, right? There's no trees around there. It's all rocks. So back in the day, Jesus was hauling rocks around, right? Working there. The guy must have, I shouldn't call him guy. Jesus, you know, must have uh, developed some pretty significant muscles, right? He was a man's man, strong. And by the time he was 12, he was intelligent enough to wow the smartest guys in the nation, right? So he was smart. He was strong. He was gifted. 
Uh, what are you talking about, Jesus, that you can't do anything uh, by yourself? He says, I can only do the things I see my father doing. Right? Kind of an extreme statement, isn't it? And you go, what is that? Kind of just trying to make a point. Are you literally meaning that? And as you go on in the scripture, you find out he's literally talking about this because of two things. One is what motivated him above everything else to come to earth. We often think he came here for us. That was second. His number one motivation for coming to the earth came out of his number one love and concern, his love for his father. He came here for his father's sake because, and most people don't think about this, the father suffers more than anybody, more than any other person. God suffers. And if you're a parent, you understand this, right? When your kids hurt, is that right? They fall down or something happens to them. It's painful for them. But as a parent, you feel their pain so deeply out of the, you know, what's going on. And so Jesus was moved and I'll prove it to you as we go through the scriptures here, that everything he did, he was motivated first and foremost by his loving concern for his father, okay? So the motivation factor is very key in living the unshakable kingdom. Hmm. What is it that motivates you in what you're doing, you know? Is it human need? Is it, you know, whatever like that? Those are secondary actually, and they're met even more effectively when we first respond to the Father, is that right? And ask him, what's in your heart? What are you doing? When you go with him, you're far more uh, fruitful and helpful than if you're trying to do something for God, right? The difference between for God and with God, right? Yeah. And Jesus said this. He said, you know, as the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. So he's saying, I want you to do it the way I did it. So these two things. Well, first one is the motivation that he was first and foremost motivated by a loving concern for his father in everything that he did. The second thing, which is also pretty phenomenal, is he depended on his father completely in everything he did, making statements like, these are not my words, I can't do anything without him. Here's this intelligent, capable, strong, gifted person that's supposed to be the savior of the world, and he's saying, I can't do anything by myself. You know, I can only do the things that I see my father doing because if it's not what my father is doing because he's my main love and concern, it's actually pointless. I mean, that, that's my passion. You know, I want to do the things he's doing because I care about him first, right? Mm. And then obviously the dependency factors that go with him. So let's look at some other verses here together, can we? Let's just underscore this uh, as we go along. And so we, we come on here to the next verses. Let's continue from verse 19 uh, on here. It says, um, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show you even greater things than these. And then we come on in, in verse uh, chapter 5, verse 30. By myself, Jesus said, I can do nothing. Yeah? I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And then it goes on. Uh, John six thirty eight. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And one of my favorite uh, verses that has just been such a, a key thing for me is in John 8, 29. It says, the one who sent me has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. We often talk about the presence of God, is that right? The manifest, revealed presence of God. H how can we... Um, experience his presence? How can we not just have moments when his presence is with us, but how can we walk in his presence, right? Jesus says, here's the key. Huh? Um, I always do what pleases him. And when our focus like Jesus is on delighting the Father, uh, that's why the Holy Spirit is here, is that right? <laughs> 
to glorify the Father yeah. and the Son, the presence of God rests with us. And we start to experience people as they meet us, not just hearing about Jesus, but actually meeting Jesus in us. Is that right? Uh, because we're walking with the Father, the Jesus way, in his presence. Mm. And as he goes along here, he's again and again talks about the words I speak in John 14, verse 10. The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me, you know, that I'm in the Father or believe on the basis of the miracles that you see happening. Then he goes on here in verse 14 and he says, you may ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Pretty strong stuff, you know. But he says, and actually greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. Uh, you can ask anything of me and I will do it. And, you know, when we, we read those kinds of scriptures, we think, wow, that's pretty cool. Let's just ask in Jesus' name and it's going to happen. But I, I got to be honest with you. I've asked in Jesus' name lots of times and it didn't happen. You know, it didn't happen. I go, what? If any two of you agree together concerning anything, it shall be done. I've agreed with two people, you know, one or two people, and it didn't happen. And the difference was right, that I wasn't understanding what it means to even pray in Jesus' name. When we pray in Jesus' name, it's the same as if Jesus himself right, is praying it. And I don't get to just open my Bible and claim a verse and say, okay, I'm going to claim this verse now in Jesus' name. No. Jesus didn't do that. He said, Father, what, what's in your heart? What do you want to do here with this little lady that lost her dog? You know? I mean, what, what do you want to do here? I want to agree with you in what you want to do. Right? And prayer is much more about agreeing with God than it is about asking God to do things. Is that right? Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. That's why it says, if you ask according to his will, he hears you. And if he hears you, you have the petitions that you ask. Right? So Jesus took the time in every situation. Your friend is sick. He's dying. You better hurry. Father, you want to do what? What, should I, what do you want to do? I want to let him die. Lazarus, right? Jesus, I mean, what? That's your friend. Shouldn't you get in there and do something about it, right? But his number one concern was for his father, right? And his dependency was upon agreeing with the father, going with the father in what was to happen. Are you with me in that? Yeah. Yeah. Totally, yeah. And, and that's, yeah. I'll share a quick testimony here. Um, some, uh, what was it, a few months before the George Floyd incident took place, right? I can't breathe. He was killed. It's about nine months before, actually, the Lord spoke to us and said, go to Minneapolis because their events are going to take place that will shake the city, the nation, and the world. I thought, Minneapolis? Hmm. It's not, you know, it's a nice city, but I don't know how strategic that is, you know? So we bought our tickets and we flew in there the week of the George Floyd incident, right? In the middle of all the craziness going on there. And as we went down in the middle of the Black Lives Matter people and all with the guns and all the stuff going on there, right? It was a pretty intense atmosphere. Mm. I looked at the, across from the very place where he was killed because they have the outline on the cement there with flowers and everything. And there was this church on the corner and the church is called the I Was So Tired Church. And well, that's an unusual name for a church. <laughs> I Was So Tired Church. So it caught my attention because we felt like the Lord showed us we were to have an international intercession time from that location in some place, right? And uh, we, who would have known that would have happened at that time in that place? Only our Lord, right? He led us right. to that place at that time. And, uh, and so I thought, well, maybe we're supposed to have it in that church. And I found out they were having a service the next day in the parking lot. So I met the pastor. And as a part of our sharing together, I said, explain to me the name of your church. And he said, well, um, years ago, he said, I was a rascal in trouble with the police, doing all kinds of really crazy stuff. And uh, I got, you know, and he went into some gory detail about in incidents with the police and all these things. He said, but then one day I met an older African-American pastor. 
and he introduced me to Jesus. And Jesus forgave me and gave me a new life. I mean, he said I was just transformed. I was able to forgive people for all the injustices. I was free from the curse of bitterness you know, and all these things. I was a new person. I was so grateful. I couldn't do enough for Jesus. He said, day and night, I was like a madman. You know, I was just going like mad to do everything I could. And he said, I got exhausted, absolutely exhausted. And uh, he said, I was almost on the point of a breakdown and I was still pretty young. And I went to the Lord and I said, Lord, uh, give me more strength. And then the Lord asked me a question. And it had real meaning for me because God asked me the same question. Why are you trying to help me? I'm God. You know? <laughs> um, hmm. Would you like to join me? Could we do this together? And he said, well, I, I had never thought of it that way, right? <laughs> I wanted to do it for the glory of God. I was doing it all for the glory of God, right? But it wasn't the Jesus way. Jesus didn't do things for the Father. He did them with him. Utterly depended on him. He said, I came into rest. And God said, now I want you to establish a church in this particular neighborhood. And it will become an epicenter of what's going to happen in the next few years. Right? And so here's this place. And so he says, I invite people who come to me and say, are you guys tired today? I want to invite you to come into rest in Jesus, right? Lots of challenges here going crazy, but there's only one person who can really make a difference in the end. And I thought, I laughed. I said, you know what? I had the same experience in my life. I was this rascal. I mentioned it earlier, right? Who was saved and those who are forgiven much love much, right? I was just uh, insanely intense, my dear wife and my family and everybody else suffered for a number of years because I could not do enough for God, right? I was just a wild man. I, I could give you details. It's, when I think back now, I thought, oh, my goodness, how did I do all of that? And I got atrial fibrillation, actually. My heart went crazy. And it wouldn't slow down. It was stopping and starting and going crazy. It was in the ambulance with the shock things and everything, going to the hospital. And the doctor came and he said, Mr. Kaufman, unless we can sell your heart down, you may not survive this. Because it was kind of going, and then it would stop for like three or four minutes completely. And then kick in again. He said, you'll, whatever you're doing now, you'll have to retire now. You won't be able to continue. And I lay there in the bed and I thought, God, is this the way it ends? You know, what, what, what's wrong here? And it wasn't an audible voice, but it was the same thing that, this, that God said to this African-American pastor. He said to me, Dale, I don't need your help. <laughs> I'm God. <laughs> I'd love for you to join me. Can we do this together? Right? And it was the beginning of my learning the Jesus way. Right? of abiding, right, of walking with the Father, of resting in him. I mean, I've done lots of crazy stuff and intense things over the years. Uh, but I, thankfully, and now I recognize, it used to be that unless I felt the adrenaline tingle, you know, I felt I was really letting God down because I love the adrenaline, the excitement, the wholeheartedness, you know, of loving God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, um, now, when, I, when that starts to happen, I, I stop and go, Lord, um, am I experiencing your excitement here? <laughs> or am I working something up to do it for you? Uh, and so the, this reality is something that Jesus lived out, didn't he? And there's a number of other verses we could read, but for the sake of time, I'll leave it there. But then we come to Jesus teaching his disciples to do the same thing, right? He said, I am the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me, you'll you bear much fruit. Because um, if you don't abide in me, apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Familiar, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. And he's saying that to us too. You can't do anything apart from me. Well, I could do a few things. I mean, you know, couldn't I? Well, of course you can do stuff, right? But the truth of the matter is, unless God does it, it doesn't last. And unless God does it, it's impossible for him to receive all the glory. We might intend to give him glory, right? But I had a little part in it, you know. 
<laughs> so uh, something that lasts in that God receives all the glory in, it has to be done the Jesus way, is it right? And so here, here we are learning to abide in Jesus, right? To depend on him uh, and to learn to pray, right? Because in the next verses, that's where Jesus says, um, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you can ask whatever you will and the Father will do it for you. By this is he glorified that you bear much fruit. And again, I'm repeating myself from before. I thought, well, let's get some words here, you know? Let's get some scriptures and let's pray scripture. And of course we use scripture as, as a basis, right? Of our truth and whatever, but his words, right? Is tuning into, and again, we come face to face with the difference between a servant of God and a friend of God, is that right? Which Jesus differentiated between there and John 15. And uh, he said, you know, no longer do I call you servants, but friends. Uh, because the servant doesn't know his master's business. The servant just knows what the job is. And a servant's goal is to get done as much as possible, you know, as, as, as quickly as possible, as good as possible. Look, master, what I've done. And here the pay, right, is the reward for the job well done. But the friend is kind of different, right? When you go to a friend's house, you don't just say, can I clean your floor? Can I, you know, what can I do? You know, you ask them, how are you? <laughs> mm. right? What's happening with you? How can I be a part of something that matters to you? Right? And it's such a uh, strange thing, isn't it? That God has tons of servants, but he just names a few in the Bible that he called friends. Is that right? Yeah. Just a few. Abraham was a friend of God, right? He wanted to know, Father, what's in your heart? And one day, the Father shared with them a pretty intense secret. Is that right? Take your only son. Have him carry wood on his back and walk with him to that mountain and sacrifice him, right? Mount Moriah, Calvary, the same place. Where here was a friend that God could trust with the secrets of his heart, somebody who was walking with God, right? Jesus did it, and now we're invited to do the same thing. And so learning what it is, we talk about the prophetic, right? So often, and that's an emphasis here. But what is the prophetic? Right? The prophetic is basically tuning into what is in God's heart. Is that right? It's what he has in his heart. It's what he is planning to do. And we can't just get that from having a uh, prepare your hearts, wait on God, and get guidance time. You know, it's more than guidance, right? And it's more than just having the prophetic gift, which some have more than others, I realize. I think it's much more about coming to know him. And you can't love him because you're supposed to, right? If you love God, then all this cool stuff happens. Right? <laughs> you love him because you know him. So our greatest need is to know him for who he really is, right? And that was Jesus' whole point. Was, you know, I, I've come here to bring you to the Father so you can know him, so you can love him for who he is, not just for what he does for you. And as we, as we come to know him and love him and say, Father, what's in your heart? And the other day, uh, some months ago, uh, we had fires here. You know, we're in California. Yeah. Yeah. Just weenie roast, right? We have, <laughs> we have big fires that take out lots of houses. And so this big fire, which was called the Bobcat Fire, I think one of the largest ones in California, was right behind our house. The whole mountain was on fire. Okay? And it was coming the... Um, the, the winds had shifted and they were bringing the fire. So there was the evacuation notice, evacuate. Fires are going to take out your house. So, I mean, what do you do, right? You go, Lord, oh, what's your guidance here? No, I didn't ask for guidance. I said, Father, what's in your heart here? What, what does this mean to you? I walked outside. I looked at the mountain that was burning. And I said, Father, your thoughts, what's in your heart? What do you want to do here? I rested there in him. And my wife was saying, hey, Dale, we better pack up. I said, no, I, I just need to tune into the Father's heart for a moment here to understand what his, his purposes are here. He's Lord, right? Nothing happens, even to the molecular level, that he doesn't at least allow, right? There's no, nothing's out of control. 
<laughs> he's the Lord. <laughs> and, uh, and, and as I was standing there looking at it, suddenly in my mind's eye, I saw the flames kind of rising up in the air and they turned like a little whirlwind and they started to go in the opposite direction. It's just like a picture that came to my mind. And so I looked at that and I said, Father, is that from you? And you know what it is when you're at, you have that peace, right? That comes witnessing, this is from my father. Okay, I agree with you. Let's do this. <laughs> so I raised my hands up there and I said, Father, you're authorizing me to use Jesus' name, aren't you? This is what's in your heart. Yes. Okay. In Jesus' name, I command this fire and the winds to turn and to go the other direction. I expected the earth to shake and all kinds of stuff to happen <laughs> immediately. They didn't. It was quite dark. I stood there with my arms in the air and I said, well, Lord, um, the substance of things hope for, the evidence of things unseen. <laughs> I, I believe that, that you heard my prayer. This will happen. And I, I went in. My wife said, let's pass. I said, no, I believe God's going to do something here. Let's go to bed. The next morning, I have the newspaper clip. The fire has suddenly turned is going the opposite direction. The winds have shifted. The evacua evacuation notice has been canceled. You know? okay. Now, maybe there were a thousand other people praying the same prayer. I have no idea. I'm not trying to take credit. We'll give God all the credit. But this matter of tuning into the Father's heart, right? As we talk about the prophetic. You know, the reason that the, so many of these prophets were able to do really strange things and suffer so much was that they were doing it with God, is that right? They weren't just given divine revelation that they blurted out because there was a price involved, you know, and there were challenges there. It was a relational thing, you know, yeah. where he shares the secrets of his heart with his friends. And the friends of God are those who care about him, what's happening to him, the Jesus way, is that right? So I, it's been such a delight to me over the years to welcome children, young people, to say, um, how about, it was actually the very first thing I ever did with kids. Shall we ask Jesus what he would like to do this summer? What would be important to him? And would you like to join me in that? And this was before I even had revelation of, you know, doing it the Jesus way. It was just, you know, what's in your heart? And I was thinking of guidance, you know, at that time. But to, to watch then his invitation as he spoke to us, and I, I won't tell you all the stories, right? That, that goes in volumes. But uh, that very first um, setting there where he spoke to us about Hiroshima, you know, which was in mm. Japan, and uh, to go with him there. And he opened the door so that our very first time of worshiping the Lord was in front of 50,000 people with the emperor and the prime minister of Japan and all the things that happened there. And we began to experience what it is to walk with the Father. In the end, we learned it was the Jesus way. Didn't quite get it personally, but I think the children were um, more tuned than I was uh, in what was happening. But dear friends, as we look at what's coming in our world, right? Many changes. We could take a lot of time to talk about those. And I have lots of other things I could share there that are coming. COVID is just the first major, well, climate change actually was the beginning. And then COVID, yeah? And then a number of other elements there. And just in case you don't, you think that God is causing climate change alone, I believe that God is allowing it. And I believe we should be good stewards of creation, right? I, I believe in environmental care. But it is something that is, is much bigger than anything man can cause or man can fix. It's a, you know, it's a God-sized situation. Yeah. And COVID is, you know, again, something that's beyond what we can really control. And the economic outcome beyond our control, the violence uh, that's coming beyond our control, the famines that are coming beyond our control and a number of other elements huh, that, are, that are coming here. But in the midst of that, oh my goodness, our father saying, um, I wanna invite you to turn to what you can really depend on, right? <laughs> you can depend on me and my word. And I wanna invite you to come into the unshakable kingdom. And I wanna end with this and at the heart of of why 
they said in New Testament times, these are the people of the way, right? The way Jesus lived was because they had learned to come together with each other, right? In covenantal missional community, right? The church of tomorrow, believers, cannot be individuals, right? Just walking with God as individuals. We are going to need to come together in God, right? To live the Jesus way in the unshakable kingdom, in the kingdom economy, right? (laughs) In the kingdom way of not just surviving, but of overcoming and of moving with God in his power. And that's going to mean we all believe in community, right? Family, community, we all love that. But there's another dimension, I think, of coming together the Jesus way with one another that God is calling us into. And I believe that as we do that, God is going to command a blessing where brethren dwell together in unity. The prayer of Jesus that we would be one is not just a helpful prayer. It's the, it's the core, right, of what is essential for what is coming in our world. We need to come together as one in the Lord with one another. And it will have practical dimensions as well, right? If we are locked out of the economy, so to speak, right? Then what is the alternate economy? Well, it's the kingdom economy, and it actually is a good one. (laughs) And uh, it really worked in New Testament times, and it will work again for us, right? And it can be possible if we put our trust in him and his word, And if we've opened our hearts to the Holy Spirit and one another to learn to love each other as Jesus has loved us. Because as you know, he raised the bar from the original love your neighbors yourself, right? That was the old command. But the new commandment is to love each other as I have loved you. And then in front of their eyes, he showed them what it meant, right? To love as he loves. They had that so vivid. They were fully committed to one another. They gave everything for each other. And there was more than enough, and they were able to share with others in it. And that's the confidence we have as we go forward. Is that right? Yeah. Just maybe a closing thought, if I may, on the awakening. This was about a year and a half ago. I woke up in the middle of the night, and I was shouting in my sleep. I don't think I've ever done that before. I was shouting. And I was shouting, emerging generations, emerging generations, Of course, that's a phrase, you know, we often use, right, to talk about the generations that are coming up and we carry a common common passion for the generations. And I thought, what in the world? Am I going crazy here? Why am I shouting this? Why am I shouting this? And then suddenly I recognized the presence of God in the bedroom, right? And it wasn't a sweet, loving sort of a presence. It was a scary Shekinah kind of presence, right? <laughs> Which I've experienced just a few times in my life. And it's usually when God has to say something very sobering and, and important. And so I kind of hushed. I said, so Father, why am I shouting this? Why are you here? And he spoke a word to me, just one word. It was remember. Oh, my goodness. I got a lot of things to Remember. But I was trying to attach it to emerging, and I realized, oh, yes, I remember the first time I ever used those words. And it was in 1984 during the Los Angeles Olympics. And I'd been invited by John Dawson and some others to give a prophetic word to the church leaders that had gathered. There were about 400 leaders, all big heavies, you know, the head of all kinds of organizations where they was there. And it was a privilege to speak to them. I've been seeking the Lord for almost a year and I had nothing when they prayed for me to speak. I was soaked, you know, just, oh my goodness. Because you can't come up with a prophetic word, right? Either have it or you don't have it. And I have the fear of God. I mean, I didn't have it. Lord, just anoint Dale now as he brings this powerful prophetic word to us. And I'm standing there going, oh my goodness, God, (laughs) please, something, something, something. And just as he said, amen, a question came to my mind and I just blurted blurted it out, you know, why are so many babies being aborted today? And I I thought in my mind, Lord, I don't need questions. I need answers here. I need answers. And, uh, and then as I was standing there, having said that into my mind came a chapter and verse Hebrews 11, you know, verse 23. And I didn't recognize what it was. 
but I sounded very authoritative. Turn in your Bibles with me to Hebrews 11, and I went there really fast to find out what it was, right? <laughs> because I'm supposed to give this great message. <sighs> and I read about Moses, right? And how his parents were not afraid of the, you know, the, the Pharaoh's edict because they saw he was no ordinary child. You know this passage, right? And as I read that, suddenly I had this download. And I realized, oh my goodness, the enemy knew it was the time because he knows God keeps his promises and he uses chosen leaders to fulfill them. And God had said to Abraham after 400 years, right, I'm going to bring you back into this land, right, and I'm going to do these. It's 400 years. So the enemy knows somewhere amongst these kids, right, so he attacks a chosen generation. And he was pretty smart, right? It was accurate to attack them. But thankfully, there were parents that paid the price and, you know, saved his life. And out of that came the, the Ten Commandments and the nation of Israel. And then found, and many, many years pass, and the same thing happens again, right? And so we turn there to the story of Joseph waking up in the middle of the night and God saying to go to Egypt. And, you know, again, this time, not Pharaoh, but Herod, you know. And this time, it was a chosen generation, not just Jesus. We, know, we don't know the story of the other uh, apostles, right, who were also little children at that time, who must have been saved as well, if they were in the area. And so I was looking at these going, oh my goodness, emerging generations, um, it's another time like that, you know, like Moses' time, like Jesus' time. And I've heard messages on that since, but I didn't know those messages at the time, right? I was just getting the download. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying, and, and today, as we see, starting in the early 70s, a sudden increase in abortion, a sudden change of Walt Disney to occultic things, all the stuff that's coming against children and young people. It's like war, you know, that has been declared on the generations. Uh, the enemy is not stupid. He's very smart, you know. He recognized when the angels were singing the heavens, glory to God in the highest. It was the time, right? He attacked the, the children of that time to try to stop the chosen leaders from emerging. And it's happening again, you guys, it's happening again. Mm. And, and I said, what he's afraid of? And I thought, what is he afraid of? You know, what, what, and two things came to my mind, I'm just kind of, you know, just in time. <laughs> and the, the first one was, right, that um, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed in the whole world for witness. You know, I believe that somehow the emerging generations are going to be instrumental in completing the last thing Jesus asked us to do before he went to heaven, the Great Commission. But what is going to be necessary for that to happen is the second thing, and that's the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel, right? In the last, last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all peoples. Sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision. Your old men dream dreams. There is going to be a great awakening, and they are, they are going to be empowered by God to rise up in him and complete the great commission. And I'll tell you the truth, I expected that to happen then. You know, I was like, okay, Lord, let's do this. And it didn't. We saw great things. I was really disappointed, like, Lord, hope I don't have to get stoned here uh, because uh, I was prophesying these two things were gonna happen and I, good things have happened here, but not quite that, you know? And so I'm remembering, okay, these things, right? And then the second thing, that um, he spoke to me. I said, so, so what? And then he said to me, they're here. They're here. Because I remember back in the day, I'm thinking I should be saying uh, the generation. I'm saying the emerging generations, plural. Right? Not just singular, but plural, I was saying. Plural. The emerging generations. And, but I was thinking emerging generation, right? Because that's what I was dealing with at that time. I thought, well, that's kind of strange, but you know, I guess the Lord led me in that. But now he's saying they're here. The generations are here. And I realized, oh, my goodness. From those I was working with, some of them are grandparents now. You know, their parents, their kids, the sons and daughters, young men, the old, they're here. They're here. Oh, I said, well, what does that mean? And they said to me, Dale, I really am preparing to visit these generations with the fulfillment of that promise and the greatest awakening the world's ever seen. Your family has experienced awakenings in China, but this one is global and I want you to get ready for it. Mm. And I said, what does that mean for me personally? And this was not very encouraging. He said, actually, Dale, I have a lot to do in your life. 
<laughs> you've got a lot of stuff you don't even see that I have to change in you. So I've been presenting myself, right, daily to him to continue to work in my life. Um, and so I don't feel I'm ready yet, but I know the Lord is preparing me personally. But then I said, what else, Lord? He said, you need to be a part of encouraging the body of Christ to come together, to come into, again, I'll use these words, covenantal missional community life, to learn to come together, not to do church, but to be church, right? In the truest sense, the New Testament sense of covenantal relationships with missional purpose. And uh, because as they prepare themselves in this way, I will visit them, uh, but they must be prepared. So since that time, that's been a priority in my heart and part of why I jumped at the opportunity to be with you today, because I believe those of you who are listening to this podcast have a very uh, wonderful opportunity to, uh, if you say that you are in Christ, and I believe that you are, then it means that you're learning to walk as Jesus walked with the Father. And that as you do that, you're learning not only how to uh, walk with him in daily life, but in what we would refer to as the unshakable kingdom way of living, which isn't just on your own, it's together with. And so I'm asking the Lord, who are those people, Lord, that I am to be covenantally committed with in a deeper way in the coming days? You know, mm. I'm involved globally, so I'm not just one place, but is there a particular place that is important in my life where I need to go deep? Because it's very possible that in not too distant future, other than Philip's transport, travel may be difficult, okay? May not be allowed. Uh, internet may not be accessible, you know? Uh, many things that we take for granted today that are wonderful things. If you are perceived as not being a peacemaker, right? If you're not a responsible global citizen, then there's a high probability that you'll be shut out of that. But if you've learned to live the unshakable kingdom uh, in covenantal missional community expressions, and there's many different kinds, then that's not going to be a hindrance, right? Maybe Philip's transport will be the way God uses <laughs> us to travel around the world. I'm right. I've actually had a few times I've stood there and said, Lord, beam me up. You know, I'm ready to go. Because come on, if he's done it before, he can do it again. Is that right? So there's no limit if you're going with God. Is that right? Then whatever God can do, we can do with him. And greater things than these will you do because I go to the Father. So we have an amazing future ahead of us in him that we are now in a process of preparing in together. So thank you for this yeah. chance to share some of these thoughts with you today. Well, thank you, Dale. I'll just finish with this. When you were talking at the beginning about that lady with the dog, I, I had this picture of um, people being tossed around in the sea and, and everybody being tossed. Everything was shaking. You couldn't see what was what. And people are not looking for people who are being shaken. They're looking for somebody who is standing solid on a rock that they can get to who can who can pull them out. Uh, and I kind of saw you standing on this rock in the midst of everything being turned around. And because you were standing on the rock and, and you stood there while everything else is shaking and you stood and you were different because you were standing on that rock. You stood taller because you were standing on that. People knew where to go. They knew where to reach out to and you could reach them because you were on the rock. When we're tossed around too in the sea with everybody else, we're no help to ourselves and we're no help to them. So I just saw you standing on that in that storm-tossed sea, um, yeah. standing solid on the rock and just reaching out your hand to all who would reach out to you. And he is the rock, isn't he? Yes, he is that rock, definitely. <laughs> Sorry, rock. I should have said that, but most definitely he is. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He is the rock. He you guys, we are, we are so positioned in God to participate with him in things I think the apostles would have given anything to be a part of. It's one thing to give birth to a baby. It's another to bring her to a place where she is without spot or wrinkle. Yeah. ready the bride for the bridegroom right and we're chosen to be a part of that so wow 
What a privilege. What a privilege. Dale, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to spend time with you and always enjoy getting to hear from you as well. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dale. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you for listening to this episode. If it inspired you, please rate us and subscribe on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify or another podcast platform.